WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM's Master of Business Administration is designed to accommodate the career needs of professionals across a variety of work organizations. More information at business.udmercy.edu. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET. I'm Nick Austin. And I'm Tia Graham. Today on the program, we'll hear about the new tool Michigan installed to allow residents to track their benefits online. And we'll hear about an art installation supporting charity and celebrating the NFL draft. But first on the Metro, last week a federal court endorsed a series of newly redrawn state house districts for Detroit and its surrounding suburbs set to take effect this November. This decision came after the three-judge panel had previously determined that the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, an independent body approved by Michigan voters in 2018, had drawn maps for the State House and Senate encompassing areas of Detroit that improperly considered race. Critics who had launched a class action lawsuit argued that the initial maps weakened the electoral influence of black voters. And despite the commission's defense that the maps were fair and adhered to constitutional standards, the revised maps aim to address these criticisms while fostering competitive elections. So to help us learn more about how the new maps shape up compared to the old ones and what it might mean in November, we're joined by Lauren Gibbons. She covers state politics and policy for Bridge, Michigan. Lauren, welcome back to the Metro. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here whenever we can talk maps and representation. But again, like you know, very important to how we get our thoughts and what we want as a community represented there in Lansing. So that's why I want to start out with you to discuss uh, the new map. How does it address the initial criticisms the federal trial court had in this case? Yeah, so the biggest change, uh, just if you're looking at the maps uh, compared to the current ones, uh, the biggest change is the way that the districts are drawn in Detroit or in the suburbs. Like currently, uh, many of the districts cross over county boundaries, uh, spiraling out of the city limits into um, Oakland County and Macomb County suburban areas. And so the big change is that there are a lot more Detroit centric districts. Other districts are um, housed entirely in the suburbs. There's only a few districts now where it crosses those county boundaries. And while the commission didn't take race into account for most of the process, they got in trouble for that uh, with the court the last time. So until the end, they didn't really know how that would play out. But the ultimate result is that there are several districts with a much higher um, percentage of black voters in those districts. So mm-hmm. ultimately, ultimately, the conclusion or the overall conclusion is the districts are a lot more Detroit centric and there's a better chance in a lot of these districts for black voters to choose their candidate of choice. Yeah, you're bringing up two different things there, Lauren. We're talking about process and we're also talking about a kind of result as well as what the uh, concerns were that brought us to this point. So before we get into the process of what the redistricting commission did, how they consider things, what people are saying, let's just get back to that decision that you alluded to from the court as well as the initial lawsuit. Can you just summarize for folks who might not be familiar what the initial complaint was and what the uh, trial court, uh, the three-judge panel, initially decided as a result of that lawsuit. Yeah, absolutely. So the initial complaint was that um, black voters were not um, being adequately represented, that they were being disenfranchised by those maps. And uh, their concern was essentially that the commission had initially redrawn uh, the districts uh, to spread um, the black voting population of Detroit out um, among several different districts instead of concentrating them in Detroit. Um, And and the court did find that the commission improperly used race while they were drawing those districts, um, finding that there was a racial quota, essentially, um, to to sort of spread um, the black voting age population throughout many of these districts. And the argument um, that was successful in court was that Um, The commission did do that and to the detriment of black voters. And um, as I was talking about earlier, um, with 
more of the districts concentrated in Detroit, not crossing these boundaries into um, primarily white areas in suburban um, parts of Oakland and Macomb County, um, it it addresses those concerns um, by really um, concentrating more of the black population into districts where they are assured, um, essentially, the opportunity to vote for their candidate of choice. Yeah, and just to clarify a bit, did the court say that it improperly considered it to the detriment of black voters, or did the court just say it improperly, the commission, considered race generally and just not allowed to do that by the Constitution? It was a pretty, um, it was a pretty uh, critical report. Um, the order um, was highly critical of what the commission came up with and did side with black voters who had argued that this is disenfranchising them. Um, so that was a, it, the main a concern was that, you know, the Constitution does not allow commissioners to do what they did um, and, and use race to draw these maps. And the argument that these black voters made was that, uh, that this did disenfranchise them. There was a lot of data brought up during the court showing um, the primary elections and how how it impacted those and well it was a it was a mixed bag there were certain districts um where the outcome uh, didn't seem to be too heavily impacted by the way the districts were drawn but in other cases um the plaintiffs argued that um it really did impact them based on the way that the districts were drawn um and and potentially disenfranchising these uh black voters You know, in fairness, I, I, that decision, I've read it also. I'm not sure that the court thought specifically uh, what the plaintiffs argued. I think they both came to the same conclusion as to the viability of the maps. But without quibbling too much on that specific point, the ultimate deal is that we ended up with these new maps. So can you tell us what the process was like this time and how it was different for the commission, as well as what folks who, black voters specifically, who had complaints and concerns about representation, was their am- input considered? And how, if so, how was it considered? Yeah, so the commission, when they did the redraw of the maps, they held several public hearings. They uh, they went through and uh, and got a lot of input from the public and the map that they ended up um, coming up with it was called Motown Sound that was primarily what the um, what the public um, said that they liked the best based on the several options that the commission brought forward to the public now um, there was still some concern from the Detroit area voters that initially filed the suit the map that was ultimately approved by both the commission and the court. Um, it ultimately uh, incumbent lawmakers uh, were not drawn into any districts together. They won't have to run against each other um, should they choose to seek reelection in November. And the um, the plaintiffs were concerned that um, that is a statistically rare probability. Um, so they, they were um, hoping that the ultimate, um, response wouldn't be that uh, this wouldn't continue to disenfranchise black voters um, by by giving incumbents the advantage. Now, with all that said, uh, the court rejected that concern. They adopted the maps. And a lot of these districts, the way that they're drawn are very different than mm-hmm. what the incumbents were elected into. So um, some of them could still um, face an uphill battle um, if if uh, other candidates choose to enter the race in these newly drawn districts. Well, let's break that down. I mean, do we have any idea or has there been time to consider what the new maps might, what effect it might have had on our election if it had happened just this most recent election or how it could shake up the election upcoming in November? What does it look like in terms of the distribution of voters and what that might mean in Lansing? You know, I think um, I think it could still be a little early to tell. Um, we've got to see um, later this month um, which candidates will choose to run. Um, that will be finalized later this month. We'll see everybody who's trying to run in these districts. Um, but I think the the overall upshot is that there's a better chance for uh, black voters to elect black candidates to office. And there's uh, there's also going to be more Detroiters in office, likely, because the way the districts were drawn initially, 
Um, they were spread out into other districts. So, you know, you could have somebody um, in Oakland County representing a portion of Detroit, whereas now that's a lot less likely. Yeah. You know, I know that was a concern. Before we get out of here, though, Lauren, I do wonder about maybe the other side of the argument also, because uh, while you do have black Detroiters, uh, you also have black residents outside of Detroit and now with maybe more of a clustering inside of Detroit, maybe there might be a dispute for the Detroiters outside of Detroit who are black. Do they have as much impact? Uh, there was a question about this balance of making more impact. Maybe if black voters could spread their message out over more districts, if they're more clustered, maybe there's less impact. So what do we know or have we heard anything about uh, what factor that might have, whether this might lead to a consolidation or a lessening of black power overall uh, in Lansing? Yeah, I think um, yeah, one of the, the big questions, especially among Democrats and and others outside of the city of Detroit, yeah, as, as you said, you know, is this going to impact uh, the overall uh, legislative majority? Um, Democrats have a slim majority in the House now, and there was concern that the possibility of, you know, it, it changing the districts dramatically could um, you know, prevent Democrats from winning again. And in terms of looking at the partisan fairness data, which is the data that is used to consider um, statewide what the chances are for Democrats to win or Republicans to win the House majority, um, that didn't change a whole ton um, when the districts were reconfigured. It's still going to be a very competitive path to the majority. It's uh, it's definitely not an easy ride for either Democrats or Republicans. But the way that these districts were redrawn, um, it doesn't appear to be the case. Now, in terms of, you know, out uh, black voters specifically outside of the city of Detroit, um, it, it kind of just depends on where they're at. But um, in terms of the overall maps and how that could impact the majority, it, it does not look at this point anyway um, to be a huge difference in terms of what um, what Democrats across the state were looking at before. Mm, it will be pretty impressive. That would be consistent then if the uh, commission was able to square that uh square that peg or in the round hole or whatever of getting that balance together, that would be impressive. So we will see in November. I know they still got to do the Senate map, so we'll talk to you when that happens as well. Lauren Gibbons, state politics and policy reporter for Bridge Michigan. Thanks for joining us on the Metro. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Always a good time as this is the Metro on 1019 WDET. Coming up on the Metro, we'll talk about how Michigan is updating its state website to make it easier for recipients to track their benefits. WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at the University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new Master of Science degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. Admission is open to qualified applicants with a bachelor's degree in any field. Course selection is flexible with no prerequisites, four required courses, and six electives. Learn more at business.udmercy.edu. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET. I'm Nick Austin. And I'm Tia Graham. People who use Medicaid and food assistance benefits know how important these programs are. Without them, many would go hungry or fall deep into medical debt. Last week, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services made it easier for residents to get updates on their benefits. That's because the department launched a function on the MI Bridges website to allow applicants to monitor their benefit status instead of waiting for a determination letter or having to call a local health department office. To discuss the new online tracker, we have Robin Grinnell. She is the Community and Education Resources Manager for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Robin, welcome to the Metro. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. So jumping in, what does the new program do and what kinds of benefits does it apply to? 
All right, I am so excited because this new application tracker is one function of many that residents have access to in my bridges. And as you mentioned in your open, it allows a resident to log into their website or their page on the website. Every resident who has an account has their own personal dashboard where they can see a variety of documents and their next steps and so forth. But usually they would have to wait until they got a notification in my bridges that said, hey, you have a letter to review. Now what the application tracker does, it allows them to click on a button and they can see where their application stands at four different stages. So it will tell them if the application was received, it will tell them if an appointment has been scheduled, if they need to submit additional documents, and then also if a decision has been made. So again, this allows residents to not have to wait around for a letter to come or to call in, but to go right to their site and see exactly what they need to see. And why is this happening now? What, what took so long for the tracker to get off the ground? I know that the website has existed for a while, but the tracker is new to the website. It is. Oh, holy cow. So the uh, My Bridges has been around about 12 years. In 2018, it went through a major overhaul. And then they really started digging into what they call human-centered design. So let's get feedback from our customers. Let's figure out what we can do. How can we make their lives easier? The tricky thing with my bridges is that we are a web portal and we have a hundred different connections on the back side of the portal to 20 different sites within the state of Michigan. So in order for me as a resident to log in and see my benefits right now, we have to make sure all of those connections are right and they're firing and they're connecting the way they should be. So the technology of this took a little while to figure out. We started working on it about two years ago. The last thing we want to do is launch something to the residents of Michigan that doesn't work. So it went through a lot of rounds of testing and putting the connections together. So it did take a little bit of time. And we were trying to figure out exactly how to do this, but once the pizza trackers and the rideshare trackers and all that came out, we thought uh, this is a great idea and we need to run with it. Yeah, I need to, to, to absorb that technology and find out another use for it, like you all have done, the Michigan Absolutely. Department of Health and Human Services. So right now we are chatting with Robin Grinnell. She is the Community and Education Resources Manager for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And just talking a little bit about uh, the tracker and the information on MI Bridges' website, you talked about how it was uh, human powered or is powered by some of the things and feedback that you heard from the users. So how much of this change was also powered by the workers themselves? We know that we had an issue with picketing last week or not an issue, but picketing for staffing last year that uh, there was over backlog of cases and files and different things happening like that. So did that also uh, push you all to do this with MI Bridges? That's always a consideration for us. Our first focus is how can we help the residents? And then we look at what are the other viable impacts in the department? So does it create efficiency in processing times? Does it re, uh, lower the rate of calls to local offices and to case specialists and that kind of stuff? So it's, it's so multifaceted. It's fascinating, but it's really practical when you get right down to it. Um, you know, we know that last week, was our first week of having the tracker. It launched on Saturday, March 23rd. And last week we had just shy of 154,000 people log into the application tracker to see where their benefits stood. Uh, so we know that our calls to our help desk, which is separate from the local office, decreased by over 50% for what it normally is wow. during the week because people can get information to it now. We know that a third of the people who logged in were from Southeast Michigan, 25% were from Wayne County. We know that's a huge area where residents are concentrated. Um, and in the very beginning of the week, there was a little hiccup with one particular program, uh, retroactive Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Not to get too much in the weeds, but a couple days later we put in a fix and since then we haven't had any errors. So we know it's working for people. We know they're getting through and we're really, really hopeful that this is going to reduce calls to local offices because you know, some people just need to talk to a person, but sometimes if you can get that basic information on your own, 
that allows the case specialist to spend the 15 or 20 minutes talking to the people who really need to work through a more complicated case. And that's really our goal. Yes, yes. So, Robin, uh, any future ideas or future thoughts about having a mobile app as well to check your, your benefits? You know, we've gone back and forth about that. And what we hear from the residents is that they the app doesn't really work for them. Mm-hmm. When we look at who we serve in Michigan, a lot of those folks don't have consistent access to the same phone or to the same computer. We have about 1,500 community partner organizations across the state that provide access to their technology. So someone can walk into a library or a local food bank or, you know, we have a whole variety of organizations and you log in through their computers because maybe they don't have the technology on their own. And creating an app actually limits access for some people, whereas the website is available from anywhere. So with equity is really one of our core focus areas and commitments with MyBridge is that we are trying to provide access to as many people as possible 24-7, remove the barriers, and that's how we'll keep moving forward. Robin, are there any other changes that the Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services is working on right now to ensure that people have easy and efficient access to their benefits other than, of course, MI Bridges website and the new uh, uh, portals that you can use? We are looking at different options in the future to potentially do some um, ability to cross-enroll for benefits. You know, if you're applying for a food assistance program, you say you have children, you might get a little pop-up that says, do you also need child development care? Um, But that's something that we have to take very slowly and carefully because each program, whether it's federal or state, has its own guidelines and requirements. And again, we have to make all those back-end connections work for them. We're actually uh, looking to hire a consulting firm in the next year who can go out and do some focus groups with residents and hear from them specifically what they would like us to do next. And so that will be a big part of our decision-making as well. Robin Grinnell is the Community and Education Resources Manager for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you so much for sharing this information, and thanks for joining us on the Metro. My pleasure. You guys have a great day. To access the new tracker, go to newmibridges.michigan.gov. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET. That's Tia Graham, and I am Nick Austin right here with you. And, of course, Tia, Mm -hmm. apparently they tell me it's almost prom season. You have no idea, Nick. You have no idea. My niece is going through it right now. She's a senior. She's talking about prom dresses and colors and cars and... I forgot what it was like. Yeah. I forgot. You know, I think some would tell you that I wore my first tuxedo for prom and then just never took the suit off. Yeah. That's why you see me walk into work every day for radio in the suit. But you always look jazzy. Well, thank you. Always you always look snappy. And if I guess if I ever needed to just drop in on adult prom, do they have adult prom? We do have one coming up soon, and you'll hear about Ooh. it on, on, on the Metro. All right. Well, I can't wait to hear about that. But while prom season has already started and some are prepping for the big day in Elk Rapids, Michigan, some students are using the opportunity to act against climate change. Climate reporter Izzy Ross tells us that some high schoolers are preparing for the big event by cutting back on fast fashion. I'd call this a mermaid sequin light blue gown with a a tulle skirt. It's got a lace up back, Mm -hmm. kind of open, very pretty. High school senior Kaylee Lamine is sifting through dresses at Tinker Taylor a small shop in downtown Elk Rapids. Tinker Taylor usually alters clothes, but today they're selling prom dresses. This one's so intense. Oh, no, isn't it crazy? It is a little dated. That's probably early 2000s. <laughs> the dresses are short and long and come in all sorts of fabrics, colors, and adornments. Neon pink satin, muted lilac, sequins, zebra stripes, rhinestones. They've been donated and consigned by people around the region and will have a new life at prom this spring. The Eco Club at Elk Rapids High School worked with the store and the volunteer group Green Elk Rapids to coordinate the event, called Sustainable Style. The event is an effort to cut back on fast fashion. 
fashion is a trend which is driven by newness. It tends to treat its products like food that spoils quickly. That's Shipra Gupta, an associate professor of marketing at the University of Illinois Springfield. The fashion industry is a huge contributor to climate change. The United Nations estimates it creates up to 10 percent of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions globally. It also creates millions of tons of waste and uses billions of tons of water. Fast fashion is especially damaging. It encourages people to cycle through clothing quickly. Gupta says younger people are especially susceptible to fast fashion because they're still forming and exploring their identities. One way to address that is for people to tap into their individual styles. You are more likely to buy or wear something that is true to your identity, true to your style. You are more likely to keep it for a longer time and you are less likely to purchase as frequently as if you were a fashion-oriented consumer. In Elk Rapids, students hope that events like Sustainable Style can cut back on consumption locally, providing a responsible place to donate and buy used evening wear, and perhaps most importantly, helping others think about how fashion impacts the environment. Zoe Macaluso is a senior and the president of Eco Club. It's like you try really hard to be eco-friendly and like don't don't use single-use plastic, recycle, compost, everything. But when it's like I have no other options, then you kind of have to drive to Grand Rapids and you have to go to a mall and you have to buy a new dress. Um, so I think this is just provides another option, mm-hmm. another another opportunity to say like, oh, I like I I have a chance here to help the environment a little bit. So I'm gonna take it. In the past, students searched far and wide for dresses, sometimes going as far as Grand Rapids, a two-hour drive south. Kaylee Lamine, who we heard shopping for dresses at the beginning of this story, says that along with reducing the need to buy new garments, the event creates an opportunity for people to stay closer to home. Not having to go down to Grand Rapids and spend that money on gas and do all of that stuff is really, really nice and freeing, and this is just such a cool idea. And it's encouraged other community members to get involved. Sophomore Addison Looney is shopping with her mom, Sarah. And I honestly was pretty nervous coming in here, but there was a lot of great selections that I... There was way more than we thought there'd be. Yeah, for sure. And I, yeah, I was pretty indecisive about it, but I picked it out. And And now it's done. That's all I keep thinking. Like, now we're done. Months ahead of the prom in May. Sarah says they've been looking forward to the event. We've been following it and waiting for it, knowing this is just a great opportunity to shop local and to obviously save money, but also just like the the resale aspect of it to not to just kind of keep dresses going because they're usually a one time use. Macaluso, the Eco Club president, says with this event, they're able to get people excited about buying used clothes. I think it really just builds off that idea of, hey, these dresses aren't they didn't go bad. They haven't expired and like they can find a new home. This May, that new home will be on the dance floor at the Elk Rapids prom. I'm Izzy Ross. That was climate reporter Izzy Ross exploring how high school students in Elk Rapids are cutting back on fast fashion for prom. This is The Metro on 1019 WDET-FM. Coming up, we'll discuss a new arts initiative in the wake of the NFL draft in the city of Detroit. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET. I'm Nick Austin. And I'm Tia Graham. And Nick, I think about uh, April 25th, we're going to have the NFL draft here. And we're going to see thousands of people coming through the city of Detroit. Um, It's really, really great to see the city happy about football again. Yeah, I know. I was happy about football till I heard the announcement of New Jersey. Here so we go. Here there's we go. trepidation until I see what these look like. But hey, maybe we can get somebody that we need to make the team better in the draft. And if it happens while the draft is here, right? who wouldn't love that? I Something know. Something to always remember. That's what I love so much about what's happening right now in the city of Detroit. Like we said, the NFL draft is about three weeks away, give or take, and Detroit is getting ready to invite thousands of people to view it. Detroit City Wall's program is taking advantage of the moment to highlight some of the city's best artwork with its depleted art program. 
The program is getting local artists to paint huge cleat sculptures and then auction them off after the draft. The cleats will be displayed at various locations across the city. Tomorrow, the Children's Center, along with longtime Detroit artist Trey Isaac, will unveil their decleated art installation at DMC Children's Hospital. Joining us to discuss it on the Metro is Trey Isaac, a veteran Detroit artist. Trey, welcome to the Metro. Also with us is Nicole wells Stallworth, Chief Executive Officer of the Children's Center. Nicole, welcome to the Metro. Thank you. Well, hello, and thank you very much. Hello, hello. So, Nicole, starting with you, how did this partnership come together with the City of Detroit Walls Project? Yeah, thank you for asking, and thank you so much for having us at Children's Center. We are truly and incredibly honored to be a part of the 2024 NFL Draft experience by partnering with Detroit City Walls and the Decleated Project. This is something that is really remarkable because for the last 95 years, the Children's Center has served our community by providing evidence-based clinical therapy and child well-being services to children and youth of our city who need them. And so um, we are truly grateful to Trey Isaac, who has decided to, uh, he was the person who basically brought all of this about because Trey uh, applied to be a part of the program and was selected. And then um, each artist was asked what children's charity or what charity they wanted to support. And Trey, based on his own personal lived experience of transforming trauma into triumph, decided that the Children's Center was a good reflection of his why and the reason that he is able to do such remarkable things as an artist. It really does give a lot of visibility to our kiddos that we serve, but also raises awareness about mental health, social, emotional health, uh, and total well-being for children. So we're grateful to Trey for that. And Nicole, just hearing that and and just hearing a little introduction about Trey and his reasoning for choosing the Children's Center, I think about young black boys and and, and mental health and some things like that. So Trey, um, you were able to secure one of those 20 coveted spots um, and you chose the Children's Center. Now get into your background just a little bit about turning uh, trauma into triumph and why you chose the Children's Center. Oh, yeah, no problem. Well, uh, thanks again for having me. Um, the reason I was prompted to choose the Children's Center was, again, uh, as Nicole had mentioned, my own experience of turning trauma into triumph. Um, that trauma in particular being me losing my baby brother and then my mother to cancer within two years of each other. Um, they both had uh, identical forms of cancer. Um, I was 16 and 18 years old at the time, and um, shortly after me having an almost decade career in amateur boxing, um, being coached by my grandfather, living in a household that was, you know, pretty um, disciplined and consistent based on whatnot, everything had kind of shifted, you know, once uh, my baby brother, my mother had passed back to back within those two years of each other, especially with us being a, a tight knit small core family as we already were. Um, I define it as kind of like a a sit-down moment in my life, if you will. Um, It just forced me to kind of like just reflect and uh, reanalyze and reassess um, what it is I wanted to do, where I was in life, everything like that. Um, uh, I bring up the boxing background because I feel like without that foundation of having some type of um, discipline or consistency, I would not be able to uh, execute or be the artists that I am today being able to tell the stories and I'm able to tell through, you know, the art and the aesthetics that I choose to do. So um, with me coming up throughout that uh, just experience of having those two traumatic losses, I looked to art as a way to kind of like cope with it, but also as a means to show myself um, a way to feel better. Uh, my grandparents had me in church at the time, so a lot of the artwork that I was painting was primarily on my T-shirts and clothing. Again, this is when I was like between 16 and 18 years old. I was painting like motivational words and scriptures on my clothing and whatnot, and it kind of just snowballed uh, to this point where we are now, me still being able to take you know other people's stories and missions and visions and values and amplify those using my talent which is uh definitely grown i'm a uh, self-taught artist um i haven't had any formal schooling or teaching or anything like that so being able to be to the point where i am now to uh live pretty much a self-sufficient lifestyle you know creating art um that's definitely a, a dream come true that i didn't know i had necessarily 
So we're running up on time, unfortunately. However, I want to ask you, Nicole, as well as Trey, but Nicole, you, you know, these installations are going to rain, remain up through May 2nd. So what do we plan to see happening with this artwork? I know we're going to have a charity event. Nicole, I'm going to start with you and then Trey, I'm going to follow up with you. Yeah, thank you. I just, you know, my my hope is that anyone that comes to view the art installation will really uh, have a great appreciation for it um, and learning more about the Children's Center and what we do, www.thechildrencenter.com. Um, and then, you know, after the um, period of the installation, these artworks are going to be auctioned off and those proceeds will go to benefit the Children's Center and help us continue to fulfill our mission of ensuring that children and families have access to the clinical therapy, child well-being services, and also access to caring foster families. So we're really excited about all of that, and we're truly grateful for Trey Isaac for his creative expression and ensuring that uh, he uses this as an opportunity to raise awareness. And Trey, my last question to you, same thing before I let you both go, just what you want kids and families to get out of the installation. I want them to, you know, get out the installation that they can uh, achieve their goals through any means that they choose to, as long as, you know, creative, uh, something that has to do with, you know, being well-being and everything like that. So just stay positive and, you know, keep your goals ahead of you. Nicole Wells Starworth is the Chief Executive Officer for the Children's Center, and Trey Isaac is a veteran Detroit artist. Thank you so much for joining us for this brief interview, and good luck with everything throughout this month. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET, and right now there's a plan in the works for every Michigan high school graduate to get two years of tuition-free community college. As part of WDET's weekly series, Mishmash, WDET's Shana Roth and Alethea Caspin from Gongra News Service explored this push by sitting down with Michigan Community College Association President Brandy Johnson to discuss the likelihood of this plan happening. They began by speaking about the history of community colleges in Michigan. I just kind of wanted to hear a little bit about sort of the history of community colleges in the state and how you think, you know, they've evolved over, you know, their existence. That's a great question. So I have the privilege of representing 31 uh, colleges in literally every corner of the state. It includes the 28 public community colleges as well as three tribal colleges. So community colleges, um, or as they were previously known as junior colleges, uh, started popping up in the state as early as the 1920s. Uh, They were really created as uh, a local place that a student could go to get started on their college education before they transferred to uh, an existing university like the University of uh, Michigan. Uh, By the 1960s, all 28 public community colleges had been uh, chartered, and uh, their mission started to really evolve uh, into playing more of a direct role in applied workforce development. Historically, we've seen community colleges get more attention when the economy isn't doing well. On paper, the economy is currently doing well, but there are more pushes in recent years to fund community college programming. So why is that? Why that shift? Yeah, well, you're exactly right. Uh, Typically, we see community college enrollment patterns that are counter-cyclical to the economy. So when the economy is really good, uh, fewer people go to community college because they're out there working and making good paychecks. Uh, When the community, when the economy is not so good, uh, we see huge influxes of students into our campuses. This was most notable during the Great Recession where uh, we had more students than ever uh, in the year 2009, 2010, 2011, uh, because uh, people that had been laid off were going back to community college to get um, to get upskilled. There was we saw a little bit of a difference during the pandemic. Um, We saw 
this kind of short blip in our economy, but we did not see huge enrollments during uh, the pandemic. There was obviously a quick recovery, uh, and we see, you know, wages are are at a premium for for low skill entry level jobs. I drive by fast food restaurants all the time that say you can work here for nineteen dollars an hour um, uh, with very little education. Uh, but you're exactly right that employers, I think, have gotten more sophisticated about really identifying their talent needs, what they need to grow as as a company and as an employer. And more than ever, employers are saying very loudly and very clearly that a high school diploma just simply isn't enough to compete in the types of jobs that they are looking to fill. So given, you know, all of those efforts, are we seeing enrollment increase at community colleges? Yeah, I'm really happy to report that this last fall, the fall of 23, uh, we saw an increase of enrollment uh, at 3.7%, uh, which uh, was actually higher than uh, the national average. Um, nationally, we saw about a 2.6% increase in enrollment in the two-year community college uh, sector. Uh, we think that has a lot to do with programs like Michigan Reconnect uh, that provides a tuition-free pathway for adults that want to uh, pursue a certificate or a degree. So while we've seen um, enrollments increase, uh, most of that has to do um, actually not with what we think of as a traditional high school uh, senior that just graduated. It's, we're not seeing increases amongst 18 year olds. We're seeing increases in those working aged adults and those under 18, that, that dual enrollment population that I mentioned. Let's talk about Governor Whitmer's big initiative this year, free community college for Michigan high school graduates. Why is that important to start with? Yeah, so the governor in her State of the State address and then later in her executive budget recommendation proposed uh, the Community College Guarantee, which was uh, an expansion of an existing scholarship program called the Michigan Achievement Scholarship. Uh, this was a uh, sort of a, a twist on a proposal uh, that came out of the Grow Michigan Together Council and the Higher Education Subcommittee, which called for making uh, the first two years of college uh, tuition free. Uh, and so uh, we were um, excited to see this proposal in the state of the state and in the executive budget recommendation. Uh, the truth is this uh tuition uh, guarantee is really more than anything else, a messaging play for students and families. Its, it, its purpose is to tell students very clearly and very simply, if you cho choose to pursue uh, your first two years of college uh, at a community or tribal college, you will not have a tuition bill. So does that mean, you know, that the overall cost of, of funding this kind of new message, is it low? What What's the cost there? Yeah, it really is relatively quite low. <laughs> um, so uh, in conversations um, uh, with the budget office, uh, we think that this proposal will cost maybe between five and seven million dollars above and beyond the current levels that were already going to be affect with the Michigan Achievement Scholarship. So by just adding a little bit of uh, in terms of cost, you can really have a much more powerful message about the importance of pursuing post-secondary education um, to really help boost uh, enrollments, which have been really declining um, ever since uh, the pandemic amongst that traditional age uh, student population. You can hear more of Shana and Alethea's conversation with Brandy Johnson just by searching Mishmash, spelled M-I-C-H-M-A-S-H, wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up, we'll discuss what one classroom in Indianapolis is doing to learn about the total solar eclipse coming up next week. Welcome 
Welcome back to the Metro right here on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham here with Nick Austin. And as we've been discussing on this show, next week we'll have a total solar eclipse. Some teachers are taking the opportunity to teach their students about our solar system. NPR reporter Lee Gaines set in set in on an Indianapolis classroom to see what they're doing to learn about the once-in-a-lifetime event. These are the only glasses that you should use to look at the sun safely. Today, Natasha Cummings is teaching her second grade class about the total solar eclipse. Their first lesson is about how to use eclipse glasses. So can I trust you to follow these directions? Yes! Next, they head to a grassy area outside Winchester Village Elementary School. There, they take turns putting the glasses on and looking at the sun. If you look up and see that... Student Jair Tate describes what he sees. See that orange thing? It looks like a street light. On April 8th, the moon will come between us and that street light, darkening the sky so that all that can be seen is the sun's corona. This brief stage of the eclipse is called totality, and it's the only stage that's safe to view without eclipse glasses. Only a narrow strip of North America will get to experience it. Yes, though that shadow is going to be perfectly right on Indianapolis to make it go so dark. The last time Indianapolis was in the path of totality was over 800 years ago. And it won't happen again for more than 100 years. For many of these students, this event is a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And Cummings is using it to get her students excited about science. We are going to be able to show the moon's shadow on the Earth to show where the eclipse will be. (gasps) So we're going to do... For their next activity, her students simulate a solar eclipse using the real sun, an inflatable globe, and a moon made out of Play-Doh on a stick. Outside, students take turns holding the globe and casting a shadow with their Play-Doh moon. Now, head scientists, you're going to hold your Earth. Cummings directs them to aim the shadow over the spot on the globe where Indianapolis would be. Yes, I can see it! It's the kind of lesson Thomas Hockey wished he'd received when he was a kid growing up in Angola, Indiana. I think what is done today in eclipse education is wonderful. I'm pretty sure that it was not something I learned in my classroom. Hockey is now a professor of astronomy at the University of Northern Iowa. He's also an umbrophile, someone who chases eclipses. It's a fascination that began when Hockey witnessed a partial eclipse at 10 years old. It was mesmerizing as more and more of the sun disappeared, producing an odd shape. Hockey says this experience was one of the reasons he chose to study astronomy. This year's total solar eclipse will be his ninth. And a special one, because Hockey is bringing a group of undergraduate students to experience totality in his home state. He says some of them plan to become science teachers. And so they will talk about eclipses to their students, and perhaps uh, we will have a new generation of astronomers inspired by eclipses. But both Hockey and Cummings say you don't have to be an adult to participate in science. All right, are we ready, scientists? Yes. Second grade student Sonia Martin tells Cummings what she's learned about scientists. When you're a scientist, you that they study special things. You're exactly right, and our eclipse is one of those special things. So are you a scientist? No. You're not? Are you right learning? Now. Yes, you are right now. Are you learning about something new? Yeah. So that makes you a scientist. As class comes to a close, Cummings asks, who's excited to see a total solar eclipse? Me! Just remember to wear those eclipse glasses. That was NPR's Lee Gaines talking about the total total solar eclipse. I always want to say that wrong. But Ryan Patrick Cooper in the groove. Um, Are you doing anything for the eclipse? Uh, no, man. I'm just going to be uh, thinking about music and then uh-huh. playing it on air for people because that is the only reason why I exist. Today I'm excited. I'm sure your mother would love to hear that. She doesn't even listen to this. I don't even think she's heard the show. Anyway, uh, today we're going to do a tribute to uh, Jolly Old Timers and their great jukebox, one of the oldest black social clubs in the city. So we're really going to be throwing down some sweet, juicy R&B today on In the Groove. 
That's going to do it for the Metro for Monday, April 1st. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. The show is produced by Sam Corey, David Lyons, and Jack Fieldbrandt. Our technical director is Nate Bender. The Metro is a WDET production, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University. If you like what you hear and want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate. This is WDET-FM Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Nick. Yeah. Not once did we talk about it being April Fool's Day. Well, you just did, so I, I know. guess you blew it, huh? I didn't blow it. This is what I wanted to do. Well, you know, you're going to make it a lot harder for our listeners to get fooled by April Fool's Day jokes now. So thank you for your service. <laughs>